Hello there! This video is going to give you everything that you need to complete your chapter 13 and final applied activity looking at leadership. So instead of focusing on all the different theories of leadership and the different types of leaders, I wanted you to focus on decision making for this applied activity. Because even if you don't have a job or you're not a leader, um, this type of decision making model that I'm going to show you is really, really useful for everyday life decisions as well. So this is something that could apply to you no matter what your job status is. So we're going to start off with just a quick overview of leaders and decision making and then spend the rest of the time looking at Room and Yetin's decision making model. So I'll give you a quick overview, then I'll show you the different types of decisions that can be made by leaders and how those are described by Room and Yetin. Then I'll show you this thought process that you use, which is kind of like a um, flow chart that helps you decide which type of decision making strategy is the most appropriate for the situation. And then I'll give you an actual example from my life to help you see how to use the decision making model so that you'll be prepared to use it on your own in the applied activity. So let's first think about leaders and decision making. So leaders are often tasked with making really difficult decisions. So leaders often have to make really difficult decisions. And they're difficult because a lot of times there's no clear solution and the decision they make is going to have an impact on other people. So sometimes leaders have to take charge and decide what to do on their own, but leaders don't want to seem like a dictator to their team, particularly in situations where leaders actually need their input. So at other times, it might feel better for the leader to make a decision based on feedback from their team or the group consensus, but this can use up precious time and resources. So the question is, how do you decide which approach is best, right? So making decisions alone, decide alone is quicker and a lot easier, but working together to make a decision is more difficult, but often necessary to reach the best possible decision. So now let's take a look at Vroom and Yetin's decision-making model. So Vroom and Yetin um, came up with this in 1973, and there's actually a whole book about it if you want to look at it. Um, but it's one of the most practical applications of contingency-based leadership theory that you read about in the textbook. So it's a practical application of contingency-based leadership theory. And if you remember, the contingency-based theories of leadership are really saying that the best leadership approach depends on the situation and the individuals being led. So this decision-making model provides leaders with a systematic and diagno diagnostic approach to de decision-making. So that's the practical application, right? So it's a diagnostic tool for making decisions. Now, it doesn't tell you what decision to make. It tells you what process to use to make the decision. And this allows leaders to bring consistency and order to their decision-making process so that they can determine the most effective means of reaching a decision based on the situation itself. And it's important to realize that there really isn't any single decision-making process that fits every situation. And again, contingency theory gets at that, right? There's not a one-size-fits-all solution to leadership. But the Vroom Yetin decision-making model offers a number of situational factors to consider and then directs you toward the best decision. So you have to consider situational factors... And then that consideration is what leads you to the best making decision making process. So for example, um, let's say that if you need a really quick and decisive decision, then the decision making model will likely point you toward an autocratic process where you just make the decision on your own. But if collaboration is what's needed, then the decision making model will nudge you toward a more democratic process. And researchers have found that managers are more effective and their teams are more productive 
and satisfied when they follow the model. So managers are, so with the decision making model, I'll just abbreviate it, managers are more effective and employees are more productive and satisfied you're making better quality decisions and you're getting the employees involved in that decision making if the situation warrants it. So more productive and satisfied. All right. <clears throat> and the nice thing about this model is that really anybody can follow it because it's, it's, it looks complicated, but it's actually pretty simple to use. So anybody can use it. Also, the Vroomia and decision-making model really requires the leader to just answer these yes-no questions about the situation. So consider situational factors with yes-no responses. And then those yes-no questions, the answer to those, is really what's going to determine what decision-making strategy is best for the situation. And these questions are really focused on um, parts of the situation that are about like decision quality, like how quality of a decision do you need to have, how much of a need is there for team commitment, and then also the time constraints and limitations. So now let's jump to all these different decision making strategies that the model will help you land on. Here in a bit, I'm going to describe this chaos, but at the end, see all these little letters like A2, C2, A1, C2? These are going to, I'm going to focus on the endpoints of all these yes no questions to the different types of decision making strategies that can be prescribed by the decision making model. So the first type of decision making style is the autocratic style autocratic and this is basically when the leader makes the decision alone now there's two different types of autocratic decision making there's autocratic one and autocratic one is when the leader uses the information available to them and then makes the decision alone with no input from employees so leader uses the info they have to make the decision. Okay, and again they make the decision alone because it's an autocratic style. A2 or autocratic 2 is when the leader gathers information from employees but they don't tell them anything about the decision that they're making. The employees are completely unaware of this pending decision and then the leader makes that decision yet again all alone on their own. So A2 is when leader gathers information from employees. but doesn't tell them about the decision. Who don't know the decision situation. They don't even know what's going on. They just kind of, leaders are randomly asking them questions and they don't really know why. Now there's a more consultative style where employees actually influence the decision. They don't make the decision, but they influence the decision. So consultative, they consult other employees who are aware of what's actually going on. So employees influence the decision but again the leader makes that final decision. They make that final decision. All right, so just like autocratic, there's two types of consultative decision making. So there's C1, consultative one, and this is when the leader informs individual employees about the situation so they know what's going on and then gathers information from them individually and then makes their final decision. So the leader. tells the employees what's going on and asks, that's not how you spell asks, it looks like ashes, 
and asks for information individually. So he doesn't get the employees together. The leader doesn't get the employees together to talk about things as a group. They kind of let their employees on an individual basis know what's going on and then asks for information from them in a private conversation. And this is what distinguished C1 from C2, because in consultative two, the leader really gets the employees together in a meeting or in some sort of group setting and discusses the situation and then has them provide suggestions together. But again, the leader makes that final decision on their, on their own, but with that in mind. So the leader gets employees to together, leader gets employees together, to discuss the situation and the decision and feedback. All right, but again, makes the final decision their self. So now we're finally getting into the type of decision-making style where the leader doesn't make the decision at the end of the day. And this is the collaborative style. And this is when the employees work together to agree on the final decision. So with the autocratic style, the leader decides alone. Um, they either use the information they have or they get some information from employees who have no idea what's going on. The consultative style is when the employees have some, they give feedback to the leader. They know what's going on, but the leader still makes that final decision. Then collaborative is when the employees get together in a group, just like C2, they discuss the problem, but then they work together to agree on a final solution. So at the end, the employees work together to reach a decision that they all agree on or a consensus. which is very difficult to do and difficult to achieve consensus. But in some cases, the nature of the decision or the situation around the decision requires this collaborative decision-making strategy. So let's take a quick look at this. When you're going through the decision-making model, you start right here at the top. And then you first you have to ask yourself, is the quality of the decision important, right? So if you say yes, then you start asking the rest of these questions. If you say no here, then it gets a little bit more simpler. So is team commitment to the decision important, right? If the answer is no, then you're going with autocratic style one, where you don't even talk to anybody else. You just make the decision on your own. So you see how that works? So you just kind of follow the process. And I'll show you, actually, I'll give you a real example right now based on something that I actually did. And I'll show you how to use this so you'll feel confident when you do it for your applied activity. So see all these questions? I'm going to answer these questions in a better, these are the questions that were um, in the decision making model that I pulled online, but I fleshed these out and did some research to make the questions a little bit more descriptive and easier to answer and you'll see those right there. So I basically took these questions, made them better over here, and I'm going to ask them of myself for my example. All right, so a really, really big decision that I had to make recently involves the organizational climate study for Nevada State College. So it was my third year doing the survey, and this time we wanted to completely revamp the survey and, and add new measures. And really the goal of the climate survey is to have an objective resource for leaders across campus to figure out what is and what is not working well at Nevada State College in terms of the way that employees experience it. So it was really important for me to um, work with other people on this effort. And I'll go through and I'll show you what led me to that decision. So my big decision was what measure should I include in the Nevada State College Organizational Climate Survey? So what measures for the Org Climate Survey? <clears throat> now this was my project. I was tasked with leading it, but I did not feel comfortable doing this all by myself. So again, 
This is a survey that's given to all Nevada State employees, and they're allowed to use this survey to rate various aspects of their work environment and their work-related attitudes and perceptions. So let's see. Let's answer the first question. Was the quality of the decision very important? I would probably say yes. And I would say yes because the survey was a campus-wide effort to be really mindful and strategic about making Nevada State a great place to work. And at the end of the day, the supervisors at Nevada State are going to be tasked with developing action plans based on the survey results. So the survey needs to include what matters to employees and supervisors. So that's a big yes. So let's go back to our picture here and let's go ahead and circle yes. Next question. Did a successful outcome <clears throat> depend on others being committed to the decision? So in other words, did we need buy-in for the solution to work? So that was also a big old yes for me. And that's because we needed Nevada State employees to take the survey, um, that we needed them to participate, and we also wanted them to read the eventual report of findings. So it was really important that others were committed to that decision. Also, if Nevada State employees were not committed to taking the survey and doing something with the findings, then the survey would be a complete waste of time. So we really need them to be committed to what's included on the survey. So now we've got another yes. Okay, next question. Was information, was enough information available to make the decision solo? No need to consult others. All right, so for that, I put big old no there. I really only understand my experiences within my department. So I needed input from employees across campus to have a full understanding of what variables are important to include in the survey. Also, by including input from across campus, I can also create allies who are going to spread the word about the importance of taking the survey, and then we'll also inform their colleagues of how hard we work to develop a high-quality survey that captures their experiences. So no, I do not have enough information. So here we go. Ooh, wrong way. So now we're landing on no. All right, let's see what our next question is. Okay, was the problem well structured with an obvious way to decide the best course of action? So was there a clear problem and solution and criteria for a successful outcome? So in that case, I'm going to say no. It was not well structured. Because survey development is extremely complicated. Um, first, you have to figure out what you want to measure, and then you have to hit the literature to find empirically validated survey scales for those measures. And there's also so many options for what to include in the survey. It's also not well structured because it's unclear what a successful outcome of the survey really is. Um, we know we want to make data-driven positive changes to the work environment, but that's kind of a vague goal or kind of a vague outcome that doesn't have a really clear-cut defined solution. So the answer would be no. Let's go back to our flow chart. So is the problem well structured? Nope. All right, let's answer the next question. Was it likely that a solo decision without consulting others would be well received and ex accepted? That's a big fat no right there. So even though I am an expert in IO psychology and the president of the college asked me to do this survey, it would be super unfair and frankly pretentious of me to assume I know exactly what matters to all employees across campus. If I made that survey alone and had no input or buy-in from my colleagues, I could probably expect many complaints about what was left out or included in the survey. Even if employees were not satisfied with what was included in the survey, they'd probably feel better about it if they knew that I saw input from many people while developing the measures, that I didn't just sit there by myself and make the decision by myself of what matters to Nevada State College. So let's add our answer here. It's a big old no. It would not be well received or supported if I did it solo. All right, we're almost there, guys. So were the goals of those impacted by the decision consistent with the goals of the leader? In other words, does everybody want the same outcome? That is a yes. So um, we all really want a high-quality survey that will help us understand what is and what is not working well for Nevada State employees. We're all on the same page there. So that led me to... A yes and I landed on G2. Now real quick if we wanted to answer the final question was there conflict about what solution was best? 
there absolutely was. I'm going to put not relevant because we already already landed on G2. But still, still answer the question anyway and answer the question in your applied activity. Even if you get to a stopping point and you have your decision, answer all the questions. And yes, there was conflict about the solution. Um, we had a ton of very healthy and um, lively debates about which measures to add and cut and what was the most important. And in the end, that conflict actually produced a much, much, much better survey. And I'm really glad that I involved all those people in that decision making process. So again, my process led me to G2 which equals the collaborative or group style. And that's exactly what I did. I formed a committee of members across the campus. We met bi-weekly to discuss the measures to include in the survey and to kind of talk to different people about that and come back and report back. And at the end of the day, it was a really, really awesome committee. It was a really positive experience. And I think we ended up with a pretty great survey. Um, and right now, I'm actually working with members across campus to implement the findings and have focus groups and figure out you know, the reasons behind the results. So it was a really positive experience. I'm really glad I didn't sit in my office by myself and pretend to know everything and that I got other people involved. So I really hope that you enjoyed learning about the decision making model and that you have fun putting it to practice in the applied activity and then beyond because again this is a really useful strategy for many many decisions, family decisions, workplace decisions that we make in our real life.